Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you might still have gotten some coffee and a bit fresh for the afternoon session as well. Uh, so, again, so my name is Mai. I'm first postdoc here at the KITP, and I'm very happy about giving this opportunity to tell you a lot about astroseismology. Um, to put in a bit of context to begin with, it shouldn't surprise you too much, hopefully. Um, but to put in a general context, when we look at stellar evolution, stars generally have two different evolutionary paths, depending on whether they are a low mass star or a massive star. So the low mass stars will eventually evolve and become a white dwarf. And if you look at the high mass stars, the definite, just the definition often says that they will eventually explode as a supernova and become even an, either a neutron star or a black hole. So I think we have a good understanding in general about how still evolution works, but a lot of the fine details that comes from these interior transport mechanisms in the stars so that will change a bit the evolutionary path. And so the problem is also that the lives of stars are governed by their interiors, um, whereas what we do is actually observe the surface properties of these stars. So that because of this, one of the questions that were raised 100 years ago by Sir Arthur Stanley uh, Eddington was kind of, what kind of mechanism can we use to pierce into the cell interiors and try to test the conditions within them? And so the answer to this is astroseismology, uh, which we've taken inspiration from seismology. So we study uh, the waves inside stars. So like the, when an earthquake happens on Earth, let's say sends waves throughout the Earth, that we can use to study the composition and structure of the interior of the Earth. And similar to stars, and similarly stars also have waves, which we then can use to study the interiors of stars. So the analogy is that for waves in planets, we use seismology, and for waves in stars, we use the term astroseismology. So astroseismology have two major goals in general, that what, what we want to achieve. One is to get a fundamental stellar parameters, such as masses, ages, and radii of the stars. And the other is to try to provide, provide con constraints on the interior uh, properties of the stars, such as their internal mixing, angular momentum transport, and their magnetic fields. So in the contents, context of this conference, I'll be focusing on this last part, uh, what we can do with astroseismology. And what, the, one of the first things I want to introduce you to is this astroseismic HR diagram which I personally think is the best HR diagram there is. And that's purely because what it tells you is that at any point during the evolution of the star, it passes through any one of these regions, then the star should pulsate. That means if you have a star in any one of these regions, you can learn something about the interior transport of these stars from astroseismology. Um, so as you might see, there's quite a lot high number of different types of pulsators in this diagram, meaning that I will not be able to cover everything. So I'll give you kind of an overview, slightly biased. Yeah, but if you have your favorite star, your favorite result, if you felt I didn't mention, please feel free in the discussion session afterwards to pull that up as well and make everyone aware. Okay, so when we use, when you study stellar pulsations, we generally talk about two types of pulsations. One of the pressure modes, where pressure acts as a dominating restoring force. And then there's the gravity modes, where gravity or buoyancy acts as a dominating a restoring force of the oscillations. So the pressure modes, mainly most of them, um, carry information about the stellar ex exterior or the stellar envelope, whereas gravity modes have higher probing power near the core regions of the stars. As you might notice here, these wave propagation diagrams for the gravity modes are quite different when you look at low mass stars and intermediate and high mass stars. And that comes from the fact that gravity modes do not propagate in convective regions. So what we have here for low mass stars, we have a convective envelope, so the gravity modes cannot propagate in this region. And as for lower mass stars, the high mass stars, we have convective cores, meaning that the gravity modes do not penetrate into this region of the stars. As the stars evolve, we do get also what is called mixed modes. So when they evolve along the red giant band, meaning that they will carry both pressure and gravity mode properties. 
um, which we can also use to learn a lot about the interior structures of these stars. I'm going to briefly mention we have other types of modes, uh, such as Rossby modes. I'm not going to go into detail because I don't have time, but I did want to mention that the first time these modes were discovered in a star other than Sun was done by Timothy Manrith, who is here in the audience. So if you want to go and learn a lot more about Rossby modes, please go and talk to him. There's a different type of modes that have also just been found in stars, and those are the pure inertial modes. So in this case, we have the Coriolis force is the dominant restoring force behind the oscillations uh, for these pulsations. What that means is, as what Rita Maria Usani has shown, is that these inertial modes can propagate in the convective core. So if you have resonance mode coupling between these inertial modes and the gravity inertial modes, that means we can also learn information about the convective cores of the stars uh, for these types of pulsators. Now, what we like to do as seismologists is to characterize our uh, oscillations, and we do so according to a set of quantum numbers. Um, so those are, if we look at the top plot here, that's the number of surface nodes shown in white where the oscillations do not move. So the degree L is the total number of surface nodes that we have. The degree M, or the azimuth of all the M, is the number of surface node crossing the equator, and the number of uh, con concentric shells inside the star that are the nodal, the nodal concentric shells are the radial order of the oscillations. What's important to take away and remember is to do, in order to do astroseismic modeling, we need to know the mode identification of the oscillations to be able to do that. So that's one of the challenges for observers to try to get these mode identifications of the pulsations themselves. There are different ways we can go about doing this. For solar-like stars, um, an example of how to do it looks like this. So here on the left, we have the spectrum of a solar-like oscillator um, oscillating in pressure modes. And so what we utilize in this case is that for pressure mode oscillations, these are roughly equally spaced in frequency. So that means if we take two modes of the same degree L equals zero in this case, and L equals zero, look at the frequency difference and chunk this uh, diagram up into segments of this frequency difference and stack them on top of each other, we get these kind of a shell diagrams where you nicely see the ridges of the oscillation modes themselves and which we can then use to identify the oscillations. What's important to keep in mind is that this uh, works really well for solar like oscillators because all the modes in the frequency range are excited. So it's easy to see these pictures in the serial diagrams. For all other kinds of pulsators, you don't get this. Okay, so you only specific or different modes get excited and figuring out which ones do and don't is also one of our big challenges in astro seismology. Um, so recently, this picture has changed a bit. So we actually now have a sample of Delta Scuti stars, for which we can build these uh, shell diagrams and kind of identify these kind of uh, ridges in these diagrams and use them to identify the oscillations. So this has been done now for 60 such Delta Scuti stars observed by the TESS space mission. And for all, what's common for these stars is they're all young uh, main sequence stars. So as the stars become older, this kind of capability goes away for these stars. A different way we can go about um, characterizing or identifying the oscillation modes is looking at the rotational splitting. So for a rotating star, uh, what happens is that as the stars rotate, the frequencies of the oscillations will split into the M components of this um, characterizations of the oscillations. So that means for a non-rotating star, as stars with the same, the pulsations with the same L and N value for different M all have the same frequency. Rotation split up that generously. And so for an L equal two mode, you end up having five different, uh, five oscillation frequencies that you measure, where M will go zero, plus one and two, and minus one and two. And so by looking at these splittings, uh, you can identify the oscillate, mode os oscillations. And you can also, by measure the size of this uh, splitting, also get information about the rotation rate of the stars. 
We can get additional information also about the inclination angles by looking at um, with these kind of diagrams. So we can talk about that again later. That's just to say that these modes also allows us to gain a bit of that kind of information. Next up are the gravity modes. So like pressure modes have the property that they're roughly equally spaced in frequency. Gravity modes have the property that they're roughly equally spaced in period instead. So that means that we can get these kind of period spacing patterns where what we do is we take uh, oscillation modes of the same degree L as the move order M, which are consecutive in radial order, calculate the period differences and plot them as a function of period. And then we get these kind of period spacing patterns. As the stars rotate, uh, that will introduce a tilt in this period spacing pattern, which we can then use to, uh, on one end, um, measure the rotation rate of the star, but also do a mode identification of the oscillations themselves. Now, one important point I also want you to take away is what's really important for us to study these oscillations is to observe the stars for a very long time. And so that I try to illustrate with these diagrams. We see here on the top left, uh, an example light curve of a pulsating star, showing you the brightness variation of the star as a function of time. If we take the Fourier transform of this light curve, we get the plot in the bottom. And then if we end up observing the star for twice as long, as indicated here on the right, what you'll see is that we get much more, uh, we can resolve these blended oscillations that we have over here. The frequency peaks gets narrow as well. So that means that the precision with which we can measure the frequencies gets much higher, okay? So the longer we observe the stars, the better we can do our astro-seismic modeling and actually identify our modes of the oscillations as well. So for this, space telescopes have been really crucial for the studies of uh, yeah, for astro-seismology. Um, so these are just the examples of the larger telescopes, also smaller ones who have really helped a lot in this field, uh, not to be forgotten. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Corot really started to give provide a lot of uh, value in the field of astro seismology. And the best data we have available to date still comes from the nominal Kepler space mission, which observed the same patch of the sky for four years continuously. Okay. Um, TESS right now is still observing. Um, and for those light curves, the longest continuous light curves you get are for the stars that are located in what is called the continuous viewing zone we end up getting a light curves with duration of about one year instead. So with this information, if we go on and try to look at some of the results uh, from astro seismology and starting with internal rotation, uh, so one of the results we have from recent years is summarized uh, in this kind of diagram. What I'm showing you here on the x-axis, that's the astro seismic surface gravity value, and on the y-axis is the core rotation rate of the star. So as the stars evolve on the main sequence and, and upwards towards red giant brands, the surface gravity decreases, and as they become white dwarfs, they'll end up in this upper left corner of the diagram. Um, so this is the status from 2018. Recently, that has been updated again with a sample of uh, Gamma Dorado stars, so F-type stars, uh, with about 600 such stars have measurements of the core rotation rates. So this tiny part here corresponds to this region or this end of the diagram. And something really to keep in mind is that for the sun, we cannot measure the core rotation because they do not have these kind of uh, gravity mode oscillations that we can detect. So if you try to put this into context and see what this has taught us. So on one end, if we try and look at the stars in the red thumb and the rotation of the core rotation of the white dwarfs and see what, how that compares to theory. So one of the things that has been found, or at least was previously an issue, is that the cores of these stars of the red uh, giant blends and branches of the red thumb rotate much slower than otherwise predicted by angular momentum transport. So what I'm showing you here on the left uh, is the evolution of this core rotation in red. 
and uh, the surface rotation in, in black, the rotation period on the y-axis, as a function of time since the terminal H main sequence. And so here the red thumb stars are indicated in gray up here, and the white dots are indicated down here. And there's a, a couple of red giants uh, indicated right here as well. So what you're seeing in this case is that the rotation period of the red plant stars are much larger than what we predict from these uh, core rotation or these angular momentum transport mechanisms, where what is included in this case in the rotational instabilities and circulation, as well as uh, magnetic fields from the Taylor-Sprout uh, dynamo. So later, or recently, this issue might have been solved. Um, so in this case, I'm showing you again. So these are the red giant brand stars in orange. Oh, yeah, so these are these ones. We have the red clown stars, and we have the white dwarfs again. And recently, uh, Jim Fuller came uh, and collaborators uh, came up with a modified version of this Taylor's Bright Dynamo that will now, when we evolve uh, the models, you end up with actually these core rotation uh, period profiles passing through each one of these regions uh, for the core rotation of these stars. So this is indicating that maybe we've obtain a solution uh, for these stars. That's a very good, nice step forward. Um, I also want to mention, if we go back and have a look at the main sequence stars up here, there's some of the things that I've recently been working on, since I have the opportunity to mention this myself. Um, so if we look at the slowly pulsating beta stars, so stars about uh, three to 10 solar masses, um, what we've recently managed to achieve is measure the core rotation of these stars as a function of the main sequence age. So in this case, we measure the main sequence age according to the fraction of the core hydrogen content, the current core hydrogen content, to the initial one. So this will start off on the main sequence, the ratio will be one. As the stars evolve, that ratio will become zero. And so what we're seeing in this case is that for the slowly pulsating P-type stars, there's a general trend that this core rotation will decrease with main sequence age. If you compare, uh, put this in the diagram such as those from before, and plot it as a function of log G instead, and compare it to results from the gamma dorada stars as well, what is seen here is again a general trend that the core rotation frequency of the SPP stars decreases as a function of age, where such a trend is not clearly seen uh, for the gamma dorada stars. Now, if we go and have a look at what, if we, this is something that we would expect to see, what we can do uh, is assume that the angular momentum of the stars is conserved and that the stars are rigidly rotating, and then go back in time and calculate what's the, what should the original uh, rotation frequencies of the course of these stars be. And so that's what is done here on the left, where the points are color coded according to the mass of the star. And these gray lines being shown are the lines tracing back to what the initial rotation, core rotation frequency of these stars should be. And as you see here, in a lot of the cases, uh, these assumptions about angular momentum conservation and solid body rotation uh, appears to be a good explanation for these trends that we see. Moving onwards, um, so aside from just the core rotation rates, we also have both core and surface rotation uh, measurements. So in this case, you see similar diagrams from before, but now the circles denote the uh, core rotation rates of the stars, whereas the triangles are the envelope rotation rates. And stars that are marked by a plus indicate binary stars. And so what we see here, for the main sequence stars, and even more so when we add the stars uh, from the gamma dorada sample, um, is that these stars tend to be uniformly rotating. And also, if you look at the red clump stars, then those are also near uniformly uh, rotating. Whereas for uh, the subgiant brand stars and the red clump, the uh, red giant brand stars, uh, we have a large amount of differential rotation uh, for these stars. So if you've been here for the program, these plots will look a bit uh, familiar. So those are provided uh, by courtesy of uh, Jamie Tyler. 
Um, so what these are showing you is on the left uh, surface rotation measurements and on the right core rotation measurements. Again, as a function of log G. Um, so just as a reminder, the stars would start up here on the main sequence and evolve down here uh, on to the red giant branch. So the stars in this case have been color coded according to their initial uh, mass. And these lines that you see are different uh, prescriptions for angular momentum transport uh, in the stellar models. And so the color green corresponds to what we would expect to see for the green data points. And it seems like roughly these data points follow uh, the observations. Uh, if you then go and look at the core rotation measurements, then we see for at least two, these two prescriptions, assuming solid body rotation, uh, that is definitely not enough uh, to explain the core rotation frequencies of these stars. There are two other mechanisms, two other prescriptions included here. And so one does better than the other in explaining the general trends, but this is still to show that there are some trends in these uh, core rotation frequencies that are not uh, exactly explained uh, by current angular momentum transport theory. So something I also wanted to mention now that we are talking about uh, core rotation versus envelope rotation is that there's one star that we have commonly referred to as the holy grail in astroseismology because this star observed by Kepler shows rotational splitting in not only the pressure modes but also the gravity modes. And by measuring this rotational splitting what has been found for, these, for this star is that the envelope is actually rotating slightly faster than the core. It's near rigidly rotating. Yeah? Sorry, uh, just a Daniel point of clarifying question. Is that a triplet for the P modes? Is yeah, this that... one? Yes. Okay. And then uh, for the G modes, are those doublets? Where, where does that come from? It's, it's also a triplet, but it's not, you don't see the middle one. In this case. Okay. Why is the amplitude in the middle one lower than the other two? So that would have, that can have to do a bit with inclination angles as well for the stars, uh, where um, depending on how the mode geometry of this, for the M modes, if you observe the star equator on, then you don't, uh, the cancellation effects means that the amplitude of that oscillation decreases. So, so that's why. So that's an inclination effect uh, most likely in this case. An additional thing to mention um, is one uh, controversial uh, result that was found for a B-type star in this sample um, was that by measuring also again rotational splittings uh, for the star, uh, what was accomplished was to do an inversion of the, of the star models and obtain uh, this kind of internal rotation profile. So what is shown here is the rotation rate of the star as a function of uh, interior position. And what you see here, so if we have zero here, blue is the uh, estimated uh, rotation rate at a given uh, radius uh, bin, and red shows the error range. And what is seen here is that the envelope is not only rotating faster than the core, but it's also rotating in the opposite direction. That seems quite uh, very counterintuitive to how what we would expect uh, rotation or incremental transport to look like for these stars. But what has been shown uh, by Tammy Rogers by doing 2D simulations of internal gravity waves is that for slowly rotating stars, you can indeed obtain such a counter rotating uh, profile uh, for the interior rotation rates of the stars themselves. Moving on to talking about internal element mixing. So I know tomorrow there is a session uh, that will be talking about internal element mixing. So I will not be going through all of these different element mixing mechanisms, uh, transport mechanisms. Just mentioned that we have group of mixing that we can categorize into a group of macroscopic uh, mixing processes. And also we have a group of mixing processes uh, that are of a microscopic nature instead. And so to look a bit at what we have learned from astroseismology uh, for these stars, we can have a look at uh, the results from microscopic atomic diffusion. And so what was done for this star 
that's again reminding you, that's the holy grail style I mentioned before, where the envelope is rotating slightly faster uh, than the core. What was done in this case, uh, you see for the M minus one modes and M equal one, uh, engraved vertical lines are the observed oscillation periods uh, of the star. And what was done was to model uh, these oscillations uh, with models that included atomic diffusion indicated by these uh, circles and models without atomic diffusion indicated by the triangles. And so what is seen in this case is by including atomic diffusion, a much better match uh, to the observed uh, oscillation periods are found uh, for this star. So this indicates that at least for this star, we cannot just ignore atomic diffusion. That is an important uh, mixing process that we need to keep in mind. And so additional studies that have been carried out uh, are, for example, by Morgan Deal, who did uh, an investigation to check um, what kind of effect uh, including or excluding uh, mixing from rotation and atomic diffusion in the stellar models uh, on the expected pressure mode frequencies in, in F-type stars. So these are still considered, in this case, for solar-like oscillators, uh, is what they try to do this study for. And so what they're seeing uh, in this case is that as we increase the mass of the stars, then the atomic diffusion starts to dominate more and more uh, for these mass ranges, uh, provided that the rotation uh, frequency stays below the 80 kilometers per second. What, is all, what Morgan Deal also showed was that if you don't, if your star has uh, atomic diffusion and you don't take that into account when you do the modeling, then the areas you end up getting on your estimated parameters on the mass about 5%, radii 2.5%, and on the age up to 25%. So it's really the age that is mainly influenced in this case. Next up, if you look at uh, gravity mode oscillations, so gravity mode oscillations are really, really great at pro probing the near core regions of the star. And this work by a PhD student Leuven, Matthias Michelson, uh, has shown that these gravity modes can actually probe the temperature gradient in the convective core boundary mixing region. So what I'm showing you here on the top is the temperature gradient as a function of the uh, internal mass fracture, where in, uh, we have in black, we have the radiative temperature gradient, in blue is the adiabatic one, and the red is the one being used in the given model. In the bottom panel, if you look at the colored regions first, that's the amount of element mixing we have in the star. So the gray region corresponds to a, the convective core. The colored region is the convective boundary mixing region where it was assumed a step-like function and then an exponential decaying function added on top of that for the convective boundary mixing. And in green, we have then the uh, profile for the envelope mixing adopted in this study. And you see then in red, the effect of the given choice of uh, what the temperature gradient used in the convective boundary mixing region is on the Brunvisala frequency. So the Brunvisala frequency is the national oscillation frequency or nat natural oscillation frequency you get uh, of an element inside uh, the radiative region of the star if, if you give it a kick and displaces it from its equilibrium position. So on the bottom panel, uh, what is different from the top ones is that in this convective core boundary mixing region, it is assumed uh, generally that the temperature gradient is the adiabatic one instead of uh, using a radiative one here. And so what you see in this case is that the uh, contribution to the burnt by solar frequency from this uh, thermal structure component decreases when we have this adiabatic uh, temperature gradient in the convective core boundary mixing region. So that is going to modify your gravity mode oscillations because they get trapped uh, in these in regions with a high Brunvisala frequency. So in that way, uh, Matthias showed through his modeling that you can actually use the gravity modes to distinguish between uh, these two scenarios uh, for uh, the SPB stars. Moving on uh, from here, uh, some of my own only, only results uh, from a PhD thesis. Um, 
in this case, uh, what I did was to look at the internal mixing profiles for 26 uh, slowly pulsating B-type stars. And so, I've, so those are stars oscillating gravity modes which have these gravity mode period spacing patterns. And so what I did was to investigate eight different shapes of the internal mixing profile and see which one of the eight um, were able to reproduce the observed period spacing patterns the best um, uh, yeah, out of the other seven profiles. So in this case, just a reminder again, gray part means convective region, blue is the convective boundary mixing region, and green is the envelope mixing. And so the number of profiles in a given subplot indicates the number of stars that preferred that given profile. And so what we see here is, first of all, there's not one profile that is preferred by all stars, okay? So it's a bit diverse in that sense. Also, if you look at the level of mixing that we get inside the stars, that is also very diverse from low mixing to very high mixing in the envelope. And what we also see is generally a tendency um, that this convective penetration, where we have an adiabatic temperature gradient in the convective boundary mixing region, see, seems to have more stars preferring that kind of profile than for this exponential diffusive overshooting. We can also count and see that generally uh, this kind of stratified mixing that you can get from a rotational mixing um, also seems to be preferred for more stars than the other ones. Um, we don't see any clear dependence if you look at mass or age of the stars for which kind of profile is preferred or actual rotation rate. What we do see is that when we increase or if, when we measure the rotation rate of the star, uh, the higher the stars rotating faster tend to have higher levels of envelope mixing instead. Okay, so from here on, I'm going to briefly mention magnetic fields, or more precisely mention who you should talk to uh, to learn more about these. Um, so there's a few examples of how we can use uh, gravity or astroseismology to try to constrain internal or uh, magnetic fields in stars. So here are examples from uh, red giants, which have these mixed mode oscillations. What has been found um, is that magnetic fields seems to be able to suppress the amplitude of the oscillations in these stars. So here on the top panel shows you what the normal oscillation frequency spectrum would look like for such a red giant. Um, and in the bottom panel, you see that modes of a certain uh, degree L of equal one and equal two seem to obtain small amplitudes uh, for these stars. So that has been found to be an indicative of uh, magnetic fields inside the course of these stars. So Friday, for those of you who were here for the program, uh, Lisa Brunier gave a really nice overview of uh, some of her work on using mixed modes to try to constrain the internal magnetic fields. So I uh, strongly suggest you go and talk to Lisa, because she'll be able to explain this much better than I <laughs> can anyway. Um, and I'll, you can even consider going and watching her talk that I know is online um, on the KRTP website. From here on, it's also been shown that by looking at these gravity mode oscillations, we can also get indication of the magnetic field strength in the stars themselves. So here on the left is showing an example of what we have uh, in blue, what the period spacing pattern would look like for a star um, where we have no magnetic fields. Introducing the magnetic field gives rise to a more uh, rigid star truth like pattern in the star. So that's an indication of magnetic fields. There's a caveat to keep in mind. When we increase the rotation rate of the star, this indication of magnetic fields seems to decrease and makes it diff more difficult to detect. I'd also like to advertise the work of Jordan Mabig, who is going to be talking right after me, not on this topic, but feel free to ask him questions as well. Um, but he did a parameter study to see um, what kind of additional parameters, aside from the magnetic field strength, uh, can modify or have an impact on the period spacing patterns when you include magnetic fields of the stars. Now in the end, I'm almost at the end of my talk. Yes. <laughs> Um, so there's a few things I wanted to mention that I didn't have time to go into much detail with. 
uh, one of them is the detection of these stochastic low frequency variability in stars that has been found. So in case uh, this is new to you, uh, what you see here is a Fourier spectrum of a star where we see in, in orange uh, the Fourier transform of the light curve for this star. And what is seen here is that the power increases as we go towards lower frequency. And so this is this red noise signature, this stochastic low frequency variability signature that we are talking about. And so these signals have been found unambiguously uh, amongst uh, high mass stars, both in on the main sequence and also towards uh, the red giant branch, uh, the red super giant branch. And so the ongoing discussion during the program has also been what's the actual source of these this stochastic low frequency variability. So I know that's an ongoing discussion and there are multiple people in the room so that I'm pretty sure would be excited <laughs> to talk about what the possible sources of these uh, stochastic low frequency variability signature. There's one other fun discovery I wanted to mention. And as the title says, it's the discovery of a single sided pulsator in a star. So what does this mean? So actually, this is a binary star. So you have, in this case, uh, you see the, the full light curve of the star, star that is dominated by the orbital signal. And at some orbital phases, the amplitudes of the oscillations become larger than at other ones. So this is what we mean, that when a certain side of the star is facing us, then the amplitudes of the oscillations become larger uh, than when the other side is pointed towards us. Um, so these have been detected for the first time in the test data. Um, and this is the second such detection uh, out of what has been known uh, previously. The last thing I want to mention, so I wasn't going to focus on determination of stellar parameters. Uh, but nevertheless, I really want to mention also results from uh, the analysis of test uh, light curves for a large sample of red giants, which allowed uh, the determination of this um, new max value. So that is, if you take the uh, this comb of oscillations that we get from the solar-like oscillations and measure what's the frequency of the maximum power, and that's going to tell you something about the, the mass of the star. And having these measurements, um, for a large sample of stars have been made it possible to actually construct this kind of Gaia astroseismic mass map for red giants. And so from here, I just wanted to leave you with my uh, takeaway messages that I hope I convinced you that astroseismology uh, provides a very powerful tool for studying interior transport in stars. Um, I've shown you that additional angular momentum transport is needed to explain the core rotation of uh, uh, red giants and red clump stars. If we have core hydrogen or core helium burning stars, the rotation rates that we get are, are nearly uniform comparing uh, the envelope and core rotation frequencies. I showed you that the effects of microscopic atomic diffusion are important when you do astrocytic modeling of A and F stars, and that b type star shows a very diverse uh, level and shape in mixing profiles. And finally, uh, using the study of amplitude suppressions uh, and the frequencies of mixed modes and gravity modes, that can tell us some information about uh, the internal magnetic fields of these stars as well. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention and happy to take, take questions. Okay, questions. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so I had a question about. Oh, oh. yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, JJ Sanazi, research associate at CETA. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a question about the, um, the star that you mentioned uh, in the middle of your talk where you detected both. P and G modes, which implied mm -hmm. um, differential rotation. Uh, like, like you also mentioned um, earlier in your talk, P modes usually, for most stars, travel across the entire star, while G modes only travel in the radiative regions. So why were you able to probe differential rotation within that star? Right, so the, uh, the level of, uh, so P modes, depending on the degree, 
So really the radial nodes are what really probes the entire star. The higher the degree, the more of the envelope you're probing. Okay, so for the pressure modes, the higher the degree you get, then the more information you get about the envelope of the star. Whereas for the gravity modes, these ones have the highest probing power near the core. So if you get rotational splitting of both the gravity mode, that tells you something about the near-core rotation, and rotational splitting of the pressure modes, that tells you something about the envelope rotation rate of the star. So, so that's the two measurements that we compared to see uh, what's the differentiality of the rotation profile uh, for this star. Hi, this is Matthew Renzo. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about the star smartest binaries on your rotation mm -hmm. versus log G plot, because they didn't seem to like differ significantly from the other points that were not crosses. So I was wondering what kind of binaries are those? Oh, what kind of binaries? That's a really good are question. Are they plot <laughs> interaction binaries or are they, oh. crazy? are they all white binaries? Like, is it significant that they are I... binaries at all? Because it, Kind of doesn't look yeah, like I'll, I'll say I don't necessarily know. I think they're quite wide binaries, so they don't have a near, um, you haven't interacted in that sense. Um, so I think what, what you can kind of take away in most of these cases is that when you have a star in a binary system, maybe you get more differential rotation for these stars, really depending on what kind of system you have. I don't remember exactly the configuration and what the orbital periods are for these stars, um, but yeah, it's it's a well separate binary these system. Are right? Yes. A uh, question from Pascal Garou. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know uh, what is known about Rossby modes and inertial waves. Okay, <laughs> Timothy, where are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so that is a very broad question. Uh, name, name. Oh, sorry, Timothy Van Lee. So, what is known about Rossby modes and inertial modes is actually a fairly broad question and a topic in and of itself. Um, in a nutshell, um, these are modes that are distorted by the Coriolis flux, as opposed to buoy buoyancy or pressure. Um, the thing is that in a rotating star, because of the Coriolis flux, those toroidal motions couple. To, um, to the buoyancy, to the spheroidal motion. So you can actually, just like we can model the G modes, we can actually model the inertial modes or the, the, the Rossby modes. And by combining those, we can actually get um, more accurate constraints on uh, the rotation profile and so on. Um, what is actually known about them? I think it's easier to say what is not known about them. <laughs> actually, I, I have a more specific question, yeah. which is uh, what what can you deduce from the observations of these modes? Okay, so that is easier to answer. So, yeah, like I already said, we can, uh, above all, we can actually measure the, uh, or accurately measure the rotation rate. Um, the thing is also that they uh, provide, um, because yeah, you have different mode identifications, you can actually also provide uh, a measure of the rotation profile. So not just an average rotation, but you can actually probe the rotation profile for the start, place constraints on that, and from that place more accurate constraints on the angular momentum transport. Um, let's see. Yeah. Like I said, there's a, there's a lot more uh, about these modes that we actually don't know. For example, uh, I know that uh, Vicky Antochi presented a sample last week um, that has a lot of Rossby modes, and we're not even sure why we see those Rossby modes. So there's a lot more uh, to be done, especially on the theoretical side of things in terms of uh, modeling and explaining those modes. Okay, and um. Maybe this will be the last uh, additional question on this. Um, uh, when when you say uh, a rotation profile, do you mean a radial differential rotation, a latitudinal differential rotation? So far, best, so far I have experience with the radial differential rotation. 
Um, maybe it is possible to go for uh, let it use a little differential notation. I'm not entirely sure how, but I've never really thought about it. So it's also something worth thinking about, I would say. Thanks. Um, hey, so uh, Meredith Joyce, um, what I, I saw that you had a slide that kind of posited different potential explanations for the um, low frequency noise signal. Um, in your in your opinion, what is the most likely explanation for that? <laughs> oh, and apologies for the spiciness, but Daniel requested it, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, what I think is it's very likely all of them are operating at the same time, so it's a matter of figuring out which one is the most dominant one, and I think that is largely dependent on mass and where you are at uh, in the HR diagram. This is my one of my suspicions for this. So yeah, if you want me to point towards one, I don't think necessarily one is the right answer. I think it's a combination uh, of the proposed mechanisms. Thanks, Mike. This is Jim Fuller. I was just curious what you're most excited on measuring with test data. What I'm you, most excited? <laughs> that you couldn't measure with Kepler data. You couldn't do with Kepler. I'm very excited about the OB stars with tests. So because of the choice of the Kepler field of view, it was deliberately avoiding high mass stars because high mass stars are bright. And if you want to look for exoplanets, that's an issue. You want to try to avoid them. So with TESS, we're actually really getting a lot of observations of the high mass stars um, and yeah, observed in the same way, meaning that we now uh, we, we can try to do astro seismology for these high mass stars. It has been done before by space telescopes, more of the, the smaller the CubeSat the telescopes have done a lot uh, for these type of stars. But for these larger scale uh, space missions, TESS is really they're gonna aid a lot in our understanding of these stars and their pulsations. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm very interested in looking in stars in OB associations. So in this case, you have stars that have similar ages and initial chemical composition. So we're modeling those stars and hopefully you can get some more constraints uh, on, on your models. Um, so I'm very excited to look at those stars uh, with tests as well. Sorry, if I can follow up, what do you think you're going to be able to measure for those stars? Will you be able to measure rotation rates or period spacings or masses? I'm just curious what you think you can get out of the data. Yeah, <laughs> so that's really depending on the time base, right? So TESS has more of an issue with, uh, with the observing strategy that it's really in the continuous viewing zone that you get these long time bases. As soon as you're not, you end up with the gaps in the data. So you can have one set of observations, that's 27 days, observe one year, and then a year later, you come back, and then it's one sector again. So that's going to be challenging for measuring, even, even if you get the re frequency resolution in a sense, that's going to be challenging for measuring these rotational splitting. So for that, it's really important to get the long time basis, and for a lot of these stars, that's not really going to be possible, or it's going to be a bit trickier uh, than, for example, data with the Kepler telescope. So it's, uh, it's trying to focusing on the stars where, that are observed where the sectors are overlapping, and for those who will gain, definitely gain the most information for these stars. Uh, hi, Vicky and Toji here. Thanks, Mike, for the very nice overview. It's more like a, an answer to Jim's question, although it was what you prefer. <laughs> I would like to add that uh, it's interesting that finally we get uh, pulsations on the pre-main sequence as well. That's something that we have never had before. So we can actually start to, to measure the interiors of pre-main sequence stars. Of course, a little bit lower in mass because I guess that's not the, uh, possible for OB stars, but still. Hi, it's uh, Dominic here. Um, thanks for the very nice talk, Mike, as always. Excellent. Um, I'm also going to answer Jim's question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, so I put a paper in the, the TransStar uh, 21 general channel from a PhD student at Leuven, Simon Bursens, who's about to uh, submit uh, uh, his uh, third paper of his PhD, which is on a massive star. So a true massive star, 15 solar masses, mid-main sequence, and we get the astroseismic three-point rotation profile from the the very center of the star, 
uh, all the way up to the surface because it's a hybrid pulsator and the core is eight times faster than the envelope. So if you want to know what the differential rotation profile in a massive star is, you need astroseismology and we can do that with TESS. So this is Evan Anders. I actually have a quick question, which I think you actually said, but I totally missed it. Um, in the plot from your nature paper, mm -hmm. which ones were the more rapid rotators? Were they which the one one were the more rapid rotators? Uh, generally, the ones where the envelope mixing is higher. So were those the ones with like the light, like that preferred convective penetration or that preferred? Yeah, so, so that's the thing. It didn't seem to show an indication, depending on rotation, which one of the profiles were preferred. Okay. So, that, so that's that's a tricky bit. So it's it's interesting if that's diverse. That's also giving a lot of issues moving forward. I admit. <laughs> but yeah, so so that's yeah. So there's no specific preference for a given profile depending on rotation either. It's it's the level of mixing that really scales with it. Cool. Thanks. Hi, this is Ilva, uh, by Thank you very much, Mike, for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on the, uh, those stars that had faster spinning envelopes than the core, and like what you think could be the reason for that, and like if it's significant, do we think that that's true, or is it, is it actually a rigidly rotating star or something like that? Okay, so I think the question is what I think the explanation for the more faster rotating envelope and cores of the stars. Exactly. Good. <laughs> Uh, again, so, so you see with the angular momentum transport from internal gravity waves, so those seem to be able to explain uh, those observations. So, so from that, that seems to be a plausible explanation to me, at least for, for these observations. Maybe there's something else that can do it, and maybe more people that are more expert on angular momentum transport want to give eternal tip. I see Dominic is raising a hand. Well, the mass transfer can do it. Um, so the star that you showed, uh, this is Dominic, um, so the, the, the kick 114, so the holy grail, so to speak, um, that has uh, spectroscopic signatures of being a blue straggler, so it potentially has a very interesting past, both dynamically and spectroscopically. Um, so the, the mass transfer in these sort of systems is, uh, is one way of getting to that point, um, but then we're limited, I think, in the seismic uh, inference because we currently model these stars as if they were always single. Okay, so this is Ilva again. So mass transfer, I thought, would only give you a, a brief phase where you can have this, this enhancement of the envelope speed, but so maybe, um, maybe it's true. I, I would love that. That would be great. Did you see any any companion associated there? Maybe. Maybe it's a merger. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, another question from Pascal Garro. Uh, is the counter rotating star mm -hmm. still counter rotating? Rotating. I, uh, is this a long-term feature or is it mm -hmm. a transient? I think she's referring to the fact that uh, wave-driven angular momentum transport can lead to oscillations, uh, which could be on kind of like a couple of year long time scales. Okay, so for the oscillations that we're seeing, there was a very coherent, uh, has very coherent signals in the Fourier spectrum. So that means in that case, they're quite long lived, so we don't really see much of a difference, at least on the time scale of the Kepler mission. So in that sense, I don't think it's related in that way to the internal gravity waves, those signatures, or, or short lived signatures. Um, I would expect it to still be there. Uh, and I know there have been additional attempts at trying to do these inversion profiles uh, by different people to see if they get the same thing. And, and that has been found as well. So it's not. In that case, when you have multiple people trying, at least it's not necessarily in, in this case a matter of method or, or how it's being how it's being done. So it seems like it's there. Um, I know again there's some controversy whether people believe it's there or not, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> but yeah, it, it appears to be a, a signature of, of this star, yes. Can, can I ask you a follow-up yes. as Daniel Quinet? Um, uh, 
to to what extent are there stars that are observed both with Kepler and Tesla, or maybe Cobro and Kepler test? Um, and uh, uh, can you measure uh, Anglo, uh, can you measure rotation profiles with multiple instruments and get similar results? Yeah, so there are, so the Kepler field view have, uh, have been reobserved by TESS. So now in, in principle, you can go back and try to expand, extend the time base. The issue here is again that the, the filter being used is not at the same wavelength range. So that means your amplitudes are not going to be exactly the same. So that's going to impact uh, your observations still and I think yeah but then depending on how much time is in between do you remember Dominic between the or Vicky so the point is also that one year of observations in the continuous viewing zone sometimes is not enough to to actually resolve these peaks to get the rotation especially for gamma doors but also SPV we know that you really need very long periods of times of observations in order to be able to measure those. So, uh, yeah. And, but in principle, there is another problem also that the test pixel size is a lot larger than the Kepler size, uh, the Kepler pixel size, which means that you will have a lot of uh, stars that are basically contaminating each other. So that will change the noise level in your, in your data as well. Is, is this something that could be addressed with Plato in the future? Yes. The answer is yes for the online auditions. <laughs> okay, we have a few minutes left. Any more questions? I see Dominic has one, but if anybody who hasn't talked yet has a burning question first, I want to make sure you get a chance. Anyone who has an exciting result I didn't mention? They want to highlight? And it's Dominic's. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to point out, because I think this counter-rotating star, star, star envelope is actually really interesting. So just to make it clear that at two sigma level, that it is a rigid rotator. So that's why there's some controversy into, into whether you believe this inversion. But we've done it different ways now, and it seems to hold up with similar uh, errors. Um, it's also a really slow rotator. So the rotation period is about 150 days. That is abhorrently slow for that mass range. So it seems to be very unusual for very different reasons. Um, and so when Tammy did her simulations for the, for the wave transport, that, that counter rotation in the simulations is a transient feature, uh, Pascal. And I think the lifetime of that transient was something on the order of thousands of years. So in the, in the, the four to 10 year timescale, uh, we're not going to see anything different in the observations. And I think this is also known from like uh, experiments as well. If you take like rotating spheres of salty water, you can get these beautiful counter-rotating counter uh, shells as well. So that's kind of cool. Okay, we're almost on to the next talk. Uh, Jordan, if you want to start setting up for your talk, uh, that would be great. Anybody else have a last minute question? And if not, let's thank Mai for the great talk. <laughs> <laughs>